There was one, you know, other story that we wanted to, to track here in terms of breaking news. Let's go ahead and put this first piece up on the screen. There continue to be um, widespread protests in Russia against the war. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, an independent tracker here says that more than the 4,300 people were arrested over the weekend at anti-war protests. These occurred uh, in cities really across the country. Uh, 21 Russian cities, they say here. I saw numbers as high as 53 different cities where anti-war protests have erupted since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Of course, these individuals know they're going to face arrest. I actually talked to uh, one person in Russia who said his boyfriend had been arrested and they had been involved in activism before. They weren't mm -hmm. too fearful about it. They said right now, like you're gonna spend a night in jail, you're gonna get a fine, but they were more fearful of what may be coming down the road if this sort of opposition and dissent continues. And you already see some of those more aggressive actions being taken. Let's go ahead and put this next piece up on the screen. So Russia is cracking down on um, information, period. <laughs> uh, we've got them banning Facebook. They're restricting Twitter. I saw also, and this is kind of noteworthy because of TikTok's connections to China, but TikTok has stopped allowing Russians to upload new content. That's right. So what does this mean? I mean, this makes it even more difficult in order to organize protests and take collective action. We're going to talk in the censorship block as well about the um, crackdowns on any kind of independent media, including threatening up to 15 years of jail time for spreading, quote, fake news— another one of our terms, right. to come back uh, to bite us here. But, you know, it's just extraordinary to see the number of people who are willing to risk their freedom in order to push back against this war. And I think we have to, uh, we have to really acknowledge how courageous that ultimately is. There's no way of knowing what public sentiment is, you know, what percent on yes. which side. It's very hard to have reliable polling out of Russia. There are some polls that are sort of state affiliated that indicate that Putin's approval rating has gone up since the invasion. Again, there's no way to know whether that is the case, but it's extraordinary to see this number of people in the streets. The last thing I wanted to note as an update to the sort of, you know, backlash among Russian society is apparently uh, Anton Dolan, one of Russia's best-known film critics, just said, uh, there's no more Russia. We are suffering a catastrophe. No, not an economic or political one. This is a moral catastrophe. And he announced his departure from the country. And that's another wow. thing that's being tracked is the number of people who were just leaving Russia, who have the means, who are sort of, you know, the global citizen types who are yeah. saying, we're out of here. The most cosmopolitan Yeah, so people. they could definitely be facing, you know, a brain drain of those type of people. And those people are all definitely going to leave. I mean, yeah. this is, yeah, look, it's a catastrophe for the Russians. I do want to temper expectations, like you said. Yeah. Currently, there have been tracked, I think, 7,300 protesters have been put in prison. That's not that many, whenever you consider the population of Russia. And Putin is broadly popular in Russia. We don't know how popular, you know, they claim 80%. It's probably more like 60, maybe 55. That's still actually pretty significant, uh, whatever you consider that. How this is all being messaged to the Russian public, I mean, how are they going to know? You know, somebody I was listening to recently, the U.S., pro the propaganda by the Russians against the U.S. and the West and the allies on their own population over the last 15 years has been so remarkable that it's difficult for us to understand that they live in a totally separate reality from us. And I'm not saying they're stupid or whatever. They have legitimate grievances with the West and, you know, they all suffered the 1990s economic sanctions. And actually, most recently, Soviet nostalgia has been going up in Russia amongst the youth. So people need to understand the mm, domestic political conditions over what's happening there. And in that context, why a war in an operation like this, especially if you control the information environment like the Russians do, well, you're probably going to see at least some support. I still think the most potent weapon against Putin's regime are going to be the body bags that are coming home. They already have acknowledged 500 dead. We have no idea what the real number is. It's probably more like 1,500 to 2,000. They only lost, what, 15,000 people in the Soviet Union and, or during Afghanistan. That caused a domestic political backlash. And when you have, you know, moms who lost their sons, they're not gonna shut up. 
you can try, but they're going to talk whenever they go out or whenever, you know, they're talking to their friends. And those whisper networks are part of what brought down the Soviet Union, in part in terms of confidence within the regime. So the more people die and you can't keep death from people's relatives, at least for too long, that's going to have an impact, I think, there at home. People, you can't ignore coffins that are coming back. Potentially. Yeah. yeah, potentially. Um, you know, it it really is hard to wrap your head around the information ecosystem that they're experiencing. And again, some of it, they have a legitimate point. I mean, when they say like, oh, the U.S. casually invaded a sovereign nation of Iraq and made up this fantastical story about WMDs, they didn't get sanctioned. Yeah. Their people weren't punished. Right. And so even the New York Times was reporting that there was some segment of the population that because our sanctions were so broad and so indiscriminate, it was pushing them more towards the Kremlin narrative. Because then you have, you know, when this war came, sort of came out of nowhere from their perspective where they were sold, oh, this is a peacekeeping mission and we're just focused on these eastern separatist regions. And then now you're getting word that there's this broader, they call it special military operation, mm -hmm. You're not allowed to call it a war and invasion, but special military operation that happens to be across the entire country. Well, that's kind of a, huh, well, that's not exactly what we expected. But now when you have, you know, a very familiar villain here in the West blanket push punishing ordinary Russian citizens in a way that they can rightly point out is hypocritical based on our own behavior, that does help to push people potentially towards the Kremlin's narrative on this. So yeah. I just think it's important to highlight these individuals, not because I really expect it to have a big mm -hmm. impact on the government, but because I think their bravery and their uh, moral fortitude here is really commendable and you know worthy of us taking a minute to take a look at. 100%. I mean, you stand up to a regime like this, it really means something. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.